Not so long ago, the American Library Association passed an official resolution condemning fascism and white supremacy in library environments. What is this about? There are people dressed in KKK sheets and brown shirts marching in the children's section? <laughs> This is library. <laughs> and how is this resolution related to intellectual freedom? In today's era of critical race theory endorsed by the ALA proclaiming an ideology that all people with white skin are moral criminals, a white supremacist could be just about anybody, even a person of color who simply isn't on board with the premises of critical race theory. Look how easy smears are. Ibram X. Kendi, the enterprising godfather behind critical race theory, reportedly $20,000 an hour for a lecture, and keynote speaker at an ALA conference, even called black Columbia professor John McWhorter a racist for essentially not agreeing with him about his ideas about racism. McWhorter self-describes as a Democrat, and he voted for Barack Obama. He called me a racist. He called me oh, a racist man. online. You he say that, that again? Had, you were called a racist said, by Ibram X. Kendi? And if he is allowed to <laughs> call me a racist... You want to step outside and settle, settle it like this? <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Metaphorically. And he's, you know, young people are going to see that. You know, him with his dreadlocks calling me a racist, and they're going to think that it's actually true. Okay, I'm going to say something about him. In general, you know, he has this kind of dichotomous idea that either one is an anti-racist or a racist. You can't be just not terribly committed to the whole paradigm. If you're not terribly committed, you are still a racist. Black individuals who identify as conservatives are routinely defamed as implicit supporters of white supremacism, including the insult of being an Uncle Tom. This movie is a pep talk. It's a pep talk for America. And it tells people that no matter your struggles, no matter how your background might have been, if you work hard in America, you can overcome. And the people in my movie, black conservatives, the people who have been maligned as Uncle Tom's, are all people who believe in themselves, believe in the country, and they believe in their God. Now, just look at this disgusting headline from the L.A. Times. Larry Elder is the black face of white supremacy you've been warned. Uh, I anticipated that that would happen. This is why a lot of people don't go into, uh, into politics, because of the politics of personal destruction. And this is not the first time the LA Times has attacked me. Uh, there's another writer who all but called me a black David Duke. This Owen said, quote, if Hitler just wanted to make Germany great and have things run well, okay, fine. The problem is that he wanted, he had dreams outside of Germany. So when people try to legitimize Adolf Hitler, does that feed into white nationalist ideology? Yes, um, I think it's pretty apparent that uh, Mr. Loop believes that black people are stupid and will not f uh, pursue the full clip in its entirety. He purposely presented an extract, an extracted it, clip. The witness will suspend for a moment. It is not proper to refer disparagingly or with, to a member of the committee. Uh, the witness will not do that again. Witness may continue. Sure, even though I was called despicable. Um, Witness may not refer to a member of the committee as stupid. I didn't refer to him as stupid. That's not what I said. That's not what I said at all. You, you didn't listen to what I said. May I continue? Please. As I said, he is assuming that black people will not go pursue the full two-hour clip. And he purposefully extracted, he cut off and you didn't hear the question that was asked of me. He's trying to present as if I was launching a defense of Hitler in Germany, when in fact, the question that was asked of me was pertaining to whether or not I believed that Hitler was a, whether or not I believed in nationalism and that nationalism was bad. And what I responded to was that I do not believe that we should be characterizing Hitler as a nationalist. He was a homicidal, psychopathic maniac that killed his own people. A nationalist would not kill their own people. That is exactly what I was referring to in the clip, and he purposely wanted to give you a cut-up similar to what they do to Donald Trump to create a different narrative. That was unbelievably dishonest, and he did not allow me to respond to it, which is worrisome and to tell you a lot about where people are today in terms of trying to drum up narratives. There is a misconception that all white nationalists have to be white. 
But let's look at Hispanic white nationalists like Proud Boys leader Enrique Tarrio and online political activist Nick Fuentes. At first, I thought the ALA resolution was solely in support of the leftist smears of Donald Trump and the tens of millions of people who voted for him. In other words, the ALA is weighed heavily on one side in today's culture wars. Those that don't share the ALA's political views are routinely slurred as fascists and white supremacists all the time by the hysterical advocates on the political left, including those many within the ranks of librarians in the American Library Association. The modern Republican Party doesn't give a damn about democracy. It's rapidly becoming... Well, let's not mince words. It's becoming the American fascist party. People as varied as former Labor Secretary Robert Reich, actor George Clooney, comedian Louis C.K., and, and Frank's stepsister, Ava Schloss, have suggested Trump is a fascist. President Biden had a, a new attack on Republicans during a fundraiser last night. The president said, quote, what we're seeing now is the beginning or the death knell of an extreme MAGA philosophy. It's not just Trump. It's the entire philosophy that underpins the, I'm going to say something, it's like semi-fascism. That's a quote. You could put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. Right? The racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. The American Library Association frames itself in direct opposition to large percentages of its library patrons, but in investigating the origin of the ALA's fascism white supremacy document, I was even more troubled by what I found. The origin of this ALA resolution came from one librarian, an ardent leftist activist in the ALA named Lindsay Kronk. She's cited as the official mover of the document, which she calls her, quote, Nazi punk fuck off resolution, unquote. Who is Lindsay Kronk? She's a university librarian, and here's what one news item said about her. Quote, this past July, she became president of Core Leadership Infrastructure Futures, a division of the American Libraries Association, after serving about six months as president-elect. As president, Kronk has been serving under the slogan, Libraries are radical and so are you. If you like that, you might like it even more on a t-shirt. Unquote. Kronk has actually posted material at her personal website bragging about her successful lobbying efforts to get this so-called anti-fascist, anti-white supremacy resolution with promised follow-up efforts in library policy passed at the ALA, eventually becoming guidelines for all libraries. It took her only 15 days for the ALA to accede to her demands after she, quote, yelled on Twitter, unquote. Now, what was her motivation to embark upon such a mission? She tells us. She begins by saying that she was outraged that a university library employed a white nationalist and that this was intolerable to her and ideological comrades who quickly rallied to her on the internet. At her own website page, she mentions no details and no evidence of anything objectionable this guy did, whatever his personal beliefs, in the context of his job at the library. His alleged crime and unsuitability to work as a librarian is that he believed something, something Kroc very strongly doesn't like. But what? And what is the evidence for her own views against this man? For information about him, she links to an internet page at a website called WTF, what the fuck, is a radical librarian anyway? The answer to this website question surely has something to do with its author, who is a militant black activist and identifies somewhere in the LGBTQ orbit. Critical race theory is definitely one of the frameworks that librarianship would definitely benefit from using. We'll get to the white nationalist in a minute. But also, at the same what-the-fuck page, the alleged white nationalist librarian in question is heartily despised, along with another deplorable, Megan Murphy, a feminist who refuses to accept transgenders as being women. The Toronto Public Library had rented a room for a speech by her, and what-the-fuck argues that Murphy should have been banned. Doubt that? 
Follow what the fuck's internal links. She considers Murphy representative of a hate group that should have no public forum. If people on the left and people who are part of the feminist movement, people who are liberals, whatever, if we're trying to affect change, we're not going to do it by attacking and vilifying and writing people off and stereotyping them and threatening them. You know, they really, they really did try to shut us down and, and we, we wouldn't have it and we had some support, um, some legal support in that regard as well. I think that so long as people aren't standing up for free speech and ensuring that this is, this is a, you know, central value in our society, then we're at real risk of losing free speech. And I think that people maybe don't realize it right now, but you don't want to live in a world where there's no free speech. That's not going to serve the marginalized. That's not going to serve the oppressed. It's not going to serve people who are trying to fight the status quo. So evidently, free speech is only free if you agree with the angry mob. I listened to Megan Murphy inside and she is my new hero. One of the things she said is that the angry mob probably doesn't even know what they're angry about and has no clue what she what she is trying to say. This angry mob who has held certain people who attended the speech captive inside the library kept shouting that trans rights are human rights. But evidently, if you disagree with them, including yours truly, a conservative lesbian, you have no rights to free speech. For the Toronto Sun, I'm Sue Ann Levy. Megan Murphy is apparently, for some, at least associatively, like what the fuck and Lindsey Kronk and the ALA in the supposed evidence pyramid here, despite Murphy's own left-wing allegiance, an example of one form of fascism. This accusation is all over the internet. Now let's take a look deeper at that what the fuck page that Kronk links to, which claims that the alleged white nationalist was in the Proud Boys organization. And proof of this is a further link to another wildly problematic website called the Anonymous Comrades Collective. It is startling to discover these sorts of websites are the source for justification of the ALA resolution. And at the very least, in a free society, those accused legally have the right to know who their accusers are. This comrade site relentlessly attacks the white nationalist library worker in question, a guy named Chadwick Jason Seagraves, who worked in a library at North Carolina State University. This is ground zero for the proof of his white nationalist allegiance. Seagraves is held to be guilty of many things, including a, quote, fixation on the LGBTQ, unquote, community, revealing personal information about far leftist activists and such. I don't know all the details of Mr. Seagraves' beliefs and story. How can I? I am not certain of many facts about him. Neither are you, nor were those who relentlessly sought to crucify him. I know hardly anything about the Proud Boys except occasional passing news items, routinely detrimental. Seagrave's alleged association to that group appears to be based on his appearance at a Donald Trump-related MAGA, Make America Great Again, Flag Day rally, a celebration of free speech and conservative values, wherein a variety of speakers, including controversial ones, had forum to the microphone. Further research reveals that Mr. Seagraves eventually died in a house fire after a gunshot, apparently a suicide. Of course, conspiracy theories suggest he may have been murdered. What is certain is that he was harassed, persecuted, and relentlessly vilified. He was sued by a leader of the Democratic Socialists of America. There were protest marches to get him fired from his library job for his personal beliefs, and even what they were is in dispute. Nearly 3,000 people signed a petition to get him fired, but the university upheld his constitutional right to believe what he wanted to believe, whatever it actually was, on his own time and refused to terminate him. Under heavy mob pressure to fire Seagraves, that college actually embarked upon a formal investigation, even including law enforcement, and found no evidence for any disciplinary action, let alone fire him. For his part, Seagraves denied being a white supremacist and various other accusations. On one of the very few occasions that he was afforded rebuttal in the media, he complained that he was a victim of cancel culture and had virtually no forum to defend himself. Seagraves stated his situation like this, quote, 
I have been subjected to an organized campaign of slander composed of outright lies, half-truths, and out-of-context claims initiated by anonymous anarchists and anti-fascists that is designed to punish me and suppress my right to political expression using intimidation with the intent to destroy my career and reputation. I categorically denounce white supremacism and, as a constitutionalist and free speech absolutist, I abhor the concept of fascism and authoritarianism of any sort, unquote. He linked to an article about when he was in good graces at the university. As late as 2021, only months before he died, he was actually conferred his university's so-called Totally Outstanding Attitude, Service, and Talent Award. A co-worker at the college, Mark Harbin, told Inside Higher Education that, quote, In ten years, I've never heard him say a disparaging word against anybody. If you're a die-hard proud boy or whatever, an anarchist, then it's going to bleed over into your work atmosphere, and I've never seen that side of him. Even if some of it's true, it doesn't have anything to do with his work, unquote. With all the accusations against him, Seagraves had received death threats, even from someone claiming to be a librarian. Killed Chadwick Seagraves was painted in a local tunnel. Old friends turned on him. A house where he used to live was mistakenly vandalized and Die Cracker was painted on the current resident's car. The house he did live in was vandalized too. Two vehicles were spray painted with Die Fash Cracker, Snow Roach, and some hammers and sickles, classical emblems of the Communist Party. He eventually sought support and comfort by email from a college professor, Stephen Porter, who teaches in the Department of Higher Education at the same college where Seagraves worked. For his part, Professor Porter, an emphatic conservative, has embarked upon a lawsuit against the university over free speech issues of his own and alleged harassment as a conservative thinker. Although they had never met, after Seagraves' death, Porter shared parts of emails he had received from him. In one, under so much pressure and revilement, Seagraves said his marriage was strained because of the constant attack upon him and alludes to his consideration of suicide. He also says that in one of the few responses to the accusations against him that he was afforded in the media, even a reference to his consideration of suicide was censored by the paper. What's the full truth of Chadwick Seagraves? I don't know. But those who made up their minds to hate him from social media exchanges and anonymous internet posts were single-minded in their efforts to destroy him and purge him from a library, fundamentally for his alleged beliefs, whatever they were. There is discernible evil in his story, and it appears that at least some of it has nothing to do with Mr. Seagraves. The American Library Association and Kronk's problematic internet leapfrog accumulation of, of alleged evidence against this man, largely from anonymous sources, is guilty too in this effort of probable smears and defamation and suppression of free speech from the Anonymous Comrades Collective to what the fuck to Kronk to the ALA overtly or covertly citing Seagraves as their kind of generic fascist poster boy, ultimately whether he was a fascist or not. Georgetown University's Free Speech Project, which documents, quote, incidents in which First Amendment values have been challenged or compromised, unquote, even has a page dedicated to Seagraves' story. It is pretty objective and doesn't take any side about his case, but the simple fact that that organization saw fit to include his tale in its archive per free speech issues should tell you something. One last thing. One internet site says that Seagraves left library employ in 2015 to another position at the university. I can't verify that. But if it is true, Kronk's resolution about a white nationalist in libraries is based on a falsehood at even the most basic level. So that's the story of the white supremacist and fascist library worker cited as foundational to Kronk's ALA resolution aimed, essentially, to weed out dissident thinkers, ideologies, and ideas from its ranks. And these days, look around. The smears of fascist and white supremacists are enormously loose nets and takes in a hell of a lot of ground. And proof of such accusations is routinely conjured to fit a desired narrative.
yet another of Kronk's own links to buttress her assertion for the ALA anti-fascist resolution is to the highly respected Teen Vogue magazine, where in the title of the article, The Pro-Trump Attack on the U.S. Capitol with Fascism Coming Home, again underscores another important target of the ALA resolution, Donald Trump and the millions of people who voted for him and whatever they thought he stood for. But there's still more to the origin package of Zealot Kronk's ALA sanctioned document. The what the fuck page she links to that passes along the vilification and censoring of Chadwick Seagraves again as a prime example for the need to ban ideas in libraries also endorses a quote moving away unquote censorship of J.K. Rowling and her Harry Potter books because of Rowling's traditional view of women that rejects transgenders as female. So, if you think a man born a man can't ever be a genuine woman, you probably fall in the fascist moral criminal lineup, along with J.K. Rowling, Megan Murphy, and Chadwick Seagraves. Who knows? Maybe by extension, following the connective, you're a fascist logic here, and today's broad landscape under that wide net, even if you like Harry Potter. But there's even more! per the origin of Kronk's ALA resolution, its latent attack upon library neutrality and free speech, and the supposed scholarly citations that are trotted out in support of it. That's the next video. But for now, to conclude what we've got so far, George Orwell is turning over in his grave with this chilling line in the ALA anti-fascist and anti-white supremacy document. The American Library Association resolution says this, that it, quote, charges the Working Group on Intellectual Freedom and Social Justice with a representative from the Committee on Diversity to review neutrality rhetoric and identify alternatives. <laughs>